Good morning, everyone. For those of you who were here yesterday, welcome back. For those of you who are fresh this morning, welcome to this event. Uh, this, is, this event is co-organized, co-sponsored by the Jackson School of International Studies and the Foster School of Business. And this panel features faculty from both of those schools. So we are we're walking the talk. And I wanted to, to acknowledge that you can't talk about Taiwan without talking about semiconductors. And we saw that yesterday, that semiconductors kept coming into the conversation. This panel this morning is our opportunity to dive more deeply into some of the issues related to that industry, Taiwan, US-Taiwan trade, et cetera. So I'm happy to introduce our two speakers, our two panelists, Marie Ankerdogi, professor in the Jackson School of International Studies and chair of the Japan Studies Program, and Suresh Kota, professor of management and organization in the Foster School, who is the Olsen Battelle Excellence Chair in Entrepreneurship. So I believe they both have slides to show us, so I'm going to uh, invite them to, to run the slide decks. Thank you for inviting me here today to talk about Taiwan and semiconductors. I'm going to first give you some historical context, then talk about the 2022 uh, CHIPS Act and sweeping sanctions on China, and then finally I'll just say a few things I think Taiwan needs to think about uh, for the future of this industry. So first, some historical context. The U.S. invented the silicon chip in 1961 giving Silicon Valley its name. This invention was a result of huge sums of military spending uh, on chips. But by the 1980s, semiconductors had become more sophisticated and hard to produce. US companies had defect rates two to three times that of Japanese firms. US makers, such as Intel, were struggling, some on the brink of bankruptcy in the 1980s, when the Japanese dominated the world market for memories, and the US military relied on Japanese firms for many of their most sophisticated chips. Meanwhile, Taiwan and Korea were targeting semiconductors. Korean firms took over Japanese memory makers in the mid-1990s, and Intel and other US companies basically survived by exiting memories and inventing microprocessors and other kinds of sophisticated chips in which software, uh, our software advantage um, and our first mover advantages were key. But Americans still couldn't produce high quality chips. And this was a weakness uh, that became a major opportunity that Taiwan smartly seized upon. Taiwan's government had gotten some chip technology from a US company in the 1970s. And in the 1980s, the government led a public private sector effort to create two semiconductor companies. United Microelectronics Corporation, UMC, was created in 1980. And TSMC, or Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation, was created in 1987. Both were ultimately completely sold off to the private sector. Dr. Morris Chong, who left China in 1949 for university in the United States, then worked for Texas Instruments, a major semiconductor maker in the US, for 25 years. Taiwan's government hired Chong in 1985 to head a research institute, and he was put in charge of creating TSMC and became its CEO. Dr. Chung knew about America's horrible problems in producing uh, chips because he had seen that Texas Instruments plants in the United States had more than double the defects of Texas Instruments plants in Japan. So he had a new idea, a new business model for chips, a foundry, which is a contract manufacturer specializing in producing chips for other firms. US and other semiconductor makers trust foundries to keep their designs and other information confidential. Taiwan's foundries have now become the dominant producers in the global chip industry over the last decade. They produce some 92% of the world's most sophisticated logic chips 
and have more than a 50% share of the global foundry market. U.S. companies still have the largest share of global semiconductor sales, many of which are produced by Taiwanese foundries. So let's now fast forward to 2022, when the U.S. enacted a CHIPS Act and put sanctions on the sale of advanced semiconductors and semiconductor making equipment to China and other uh, unfriendly nations, quote unquote, unfriendly nations. The 2022 Chips and Science Act provides $52.7 billion for semiconductor R&D, manufacturing, and workforce development to attract U.S., but especially foreign corporate investment in manufacturing semiconductors in the United States. Recipients of CHIPS Act money are not allowed to invest in advanced chip manufacturing in foreign countries of concern, especially China, for 10 years after they receive the award. There are other conditions that come along with the CHIPS Act, such as sharing, quote unquote, excess profits with the U.S. government, limits on stock buybacks and dividends, and sharing corporate information with the U.S. government. If recipients violate these conditions, they must return the full amount of their subsidies. The Act also provides $24 billion in tax credits for chip production and another $200 billion for broader STEM, R&D, workforce, and economic development through the NSF and the U.S. Departments of Energy and Commerce. It's largely aimed at bringing chip making back to the United States to reduce U.S. dependence on chips made in Taiwan due to the China threat. The act also promotes more economically secure and friendly chip supply chains. Sweeping sanctions against China's chip sector also started in 2022, making it very difficult for U.S., Asian, and European firms to sell advanced chips and advanced semiconductor making equipment to China or to produce advanced chips in China. The goal here is to slow China's technological advances in chips to try and help the U.S. maintain uh, military superiority. So I have, I have five comments about these industrial policies of the United States. One, $52 billion to bring chip manufacturing back uh, is very little to jumpstart a very high-cost industry. In comparison, TSMC is spending $40 billion on two foundries in Arizona. Two, TSMC knew that investing in the United States would not make economic sense, but it's actually finding it much more costly than it expected and much more difficult to find qualified, motivated, and hardworking American workers. So producing chips in America is going to cost much more than those made in Taiwan. Three, TSMC is keeping its most advanced technology at home to provide a sort of so-called silicon shield, which is the idea that the world's heavy dependence on Taiwan for advanced semiconductors will protect Taiwan from invasion. Yet TSMC realizes it needs to diversify production geographically to hedge geopolitical risks. They're building two factories in the United States. They built one in Japan and are just announced another, uh, both with help from the Japanese government giving su subsidies. Uh, the EU is planning its own CHIPS Act, which will come out soon, and we're expecting a TSMC plant uh, somewhere in the EU, probably Germany. Yet Taiwan is worried that manufacturing chips in other countries is going to weaken this silicon shield. My fourth point, these new industrial policies have many complications. They prioritize economic security over profit, clashing with shareholder demands and free market capitalism. So the U.S. is using its commitment to defend its allies as leverage to get them to protect the alliance's economic security 
and the U.S.'s military edge. I should note that the U.S. has very little experience with these types of industrial policies, but they are trying to create some order out of what is increasingly a, a world in disorder. Five, the conditions on firms accepting U.S. subsidies under the, the CHIPS Act were just announced six weeks ago, and they're somewhat vague and not yet agreed upon. Last month, TSMC's chairman said some of them are unacceptable. The Korean government has also complained to the U.S. government about uh, some of the issues that would hurt Korean chip makers. So these efforts are very complicated and involve a very delicate balancing act. So third and finally, I just want to mention three issues that I think Taiwan needs to think about over the long term in relation to semiconductors. One, the foundry model is great, but it can also trap Taiwanese chip makers over the long run. The foundry model is totally based on trust that the foundry company will not expand beyond its foundry role. Thus, contract manufacturing over the long run can limit firms to focusing on production rather than thinking about sp and spending R&D on creating breakthrough products and strong brand names over the long run. Two, Semiconductor exports are equal to 25% of Taiwan's GDP, so this is a major success story. But Taiwan needs to be thinking about what the next big thing for it might be. Over the long run, it needs to boost its software capabilities in order to embed software in their very strong uh, hardware capabilities and hardware. Third, uh, Taiwan's wages have stagnated significantly over the last couple of decades. And by 2019, about 10% of their semiconductor engineers had left for positions in the mainland. Many Taiwanese engineering professors have also moved to Chinese universities or are moonlighting there um, a few days a week. So this move to China has been somewhat um, slowed down due to COVID and U.S.-China trade friction, but Taiwan's human resource problem is also exacerbated by its very low birth rate over the last decades. This is not just Taiwan. Japan has it. Korea has it. Many countries have problems in this way. But somehow I think this serious brain drain, as well as the difficulties in nurturing enough domestic talent for the future of the chip industry, uh, need to be addressed. So in conclusion, Taiwan and the U.S. are trying to optimize their economic and geopolitical positions and navigate the crumbling world order that we now live in. The leading companies and products in the chip industry have changed several times since this industry emerged in the 1960s. So Taiwan, the U.S., and their Asian and European allies need to be prepared for change. The Economic Security Alliance that has recently emerged is unprecedented, but very fragile. Hopefully, it assures Alliance members access to advanced semiconductors in the future, no matter where they're designed or produced, and whether the world evolves into blocks, some sort of new Cold War, or more serious decoupling. Success involves everyone sacrificing some of their profits and national and corporate interests to maximize the collective good. This will not be easy to navigate. Thank you. Thanks, Marie. We'll turn things over to Suresh. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for having me here on a great, beautiful day, and thank you for attending, too. Uh, this is a collaboration between the Business School and the Jackson School. And the Jackson School is, as you know, focuses on policy, and we focus on industries and companies. And we don't get into policy, at least <laughs> not at uh, the Business School in the, uh, the way you do in the, in the Jackson School. Um, so I wanted to talk about a couple of items. One is to talk a little about the importance of this industry and give you some numbers about the industry characteristics. 
Um, the, the reason is to just set a context for how big this industry is and why it's important. I'm going to take a U.S. perspective, uh, not a Chinese or Taiwanese perspective. Second, I want to talk a little about um, why this recent interest um, in this industry. You know, going back to my doctoral days in the 1980s, this, this, this debate about whether the U.S. should um, outsource manufacturing and offshore manufacturing and hauling of the American corporation um, has taken place. It's been 30 years. It's nice to go back and revisit it and where we are at this point in time. Um, and the third, I don't want to get too much into uh, Intel because I've opened it up for questions. I'll kind of highlight some of the important things. One of the important things is to talk about the TikTok strategy, which is, uh, which is a very interesting strategy put in place by Andy Grove, one of the early CEOs of the company. So let me start. So some of you know this is an amazing industry with major technological innovations. This is one of the few industries where the product gets better and cheaper every year. Uh, every 18 months, you, you got a, a number of transistors on a microprocessor doubles. And you can see from the numbers here, uh, I don't know if you can see there, but 1970 Intel introduces the 404 uh, chip, 400 chip, which had about 100 transistors. By 1995, they introduced Pentium. All of you have heard the Pentium processor. It had about a million transistors. And if you go all the way up to the chart there, you can see today we are in $50 billion range. And the cost of producing some of these chips is about a billion dollars these days. And it's very, very expensive. So if Taiwan wants to get involved in the manufacturing or the design of these chips, the design of the chips itself is about a billion dollars. And they're very, very strong American companies that can give uh, Taiwan a run for its money. Um, so this is the nature of the technology and how the technology has progressed. Um, and today's smartphone, for example, is more powerful than the mainframe computer that was used in Apollo 11 to send, uh, send the, send, uh, on the mission to the moon. So you can see how powerful the chip has gotten. This chart kind of gives you the overview of the industry in terms of the numbers involved. You can see in 2021, the, the revenues for the industry were about $590 billion. And the projected revenues for 2030 is about a trillion dollars. So and the compounded growth of this industry from 2021 to 2030, they're expecting it to grow about 7% each year. Uh, and you can also see on the right, the industries that consume this chip, computing and data storage, as you would expect, uh, wireless communication, the smartphones that uh, you would expect that too, and automotive, those three industries together consume about 70% of the chips. So you can see those are the very powerful industries that are, uh, that are supporting this industry. Uh, the other in important characteristics of this industry is the boom and bust cycles. You can see uh, their demand and then their slowing of demand. Every time there's an investment, uh, um, for to meet demand, there's a, an extra uh, capacity and, and there's a bus cycle. Um, and, but the compounded growth over a long period of time is about 7.5 percent from 1990 to 2020. Um, so right now in 2023, we're, uh, we're going, we are forecasted, forecasted to expect uh, increased um, supply rather than demand. And about that by 2000, 2030, I think that the, the supply will catch up with the demand. The other astonishing factor about this industry is the amount of R&D involved. And I was surprised when I looked at these numbers. This industry, you can see for semiconductor, is consuming R&D as a percentage of revenues even higher than the pharmaceutical industry. Um, and on the right, you see it's not only R&D that's required, that's on the design side. Uh, and you can see most of the R&D expenses are on the design of the chip. And on the right side, you can see the capital investments required in this particular industry too. And you can see 28, is 26% of the revenues are set aside for uh, capital expenditures. And if you want to meet the 2030 demand for chips, uh, the industry is forecasted to spend about $800 billion in capital expenditures. So that is the amount of money that uh, this particular industry demands. They're just the more slow. I said the chip, the number of transistors in the chip doubles about every two years. There's also the Arthur Rock's law. Arthur Rock is a legendary VC investor, and he was one of the early investors in Apple and Intel. He kind of postulated his own law, 
and his law said the cost of a plant to make the next generation chip doubles every four years. This is kind of a very simplified version of the supply chain and you can see on the right there's companies that purely design chips and there's companies that manufacture the chips that they call the fabs or foundries the manufacturing plants and on the right there's a whole bunch of companies that package and assemble chips. These are the final products that go into the end product like computers or uh, automotives and so on and so forth. Now, the designing of chips, lots of companies are getting in, involved in the design of chips and you can see an Apple is also listed there. Apple now designs its own chips. Uh, Tesla is designing its own chips. Uh, Google is designing its own chips. And then this manufacturing is going to TMC and Samsung do the manufacturing. Those are the foundries that are available. Intel is what we call an integrated design and manufacturing company that has its own manufacturing facilities and design. That's one of the rare companies that does it. And Samsung is the other one that has its own man design and manufacturing too. Um, why is, there the why is there a recent interest in this, in this particular industry? One, we all know about COVID and the shortages that COVID created in the supply chain. And one of the byproducts of that was there was a lot of chip shortage. And you know, the automotive companies in the U.S. faced a big major shortage. And uh, at least estimates said they were short by 3 million units that they could have sold. Um, so that was one of the big things, is saying, okay, the cha supply chain is, is, is great great efficiency, but in terms of an external shock, it's not able to handle this um, shock. The second is the recognition because of the shortage that U.S. is dependent upon uh, East Asia for a lot of its chips. So there was an awakening in the Defense Department here and said, hey, if we're going to depend on East Asia for some of our advanced chips, we have a problem here because a lot of our defense systems depend on these advanced chips. So they said, okay, we need to do something, at least get some minimum manufacturing in the U.S. The third, of course, is the fear of China. China has made it explicit that they want to surpass the U.S. in terms of chip production and chip design. And that's also creating a, a lot of fear in the Defense Department because some of the new missiles that are coming out, the hypersonic missiles that, are, are, uh, that require some of these advanced um, semiconductors. This chart kind of highlights the changing of market share. On the, on the left, you see um, fascinating that Korea, uh, South Korea, Taiwan, and China had zero manufacturing capacity in 1990. Uh, this was the time when uh, TMC was beginning to start. Design companies were beginning to outsource. Before that, uh, the U.S., if you look at Jerry Sanders, the guy who uh, um, founded AMD, one of the competitors to Intel, he said, real men have fabs. And so it was all based about fabs. But now I think the fabless companies have come around. And you can see all of a sudden by 2022, two countries dominate the space, Taiwan and South Korea. And there's nothing wrong with that, except Taiwan is very close to China. And China has made it very clear that it wants to reunite with uh, Taiwan. And South Korea is just to the south of North Korea. And that's not a very uh, safe place either. And on the right, you know, one of the things you see is the most advanced chips, um, less than 10 nanometers. So what does that really mean? What does less than 10 nanometers mean? <coughs> one nanometer is, if you, the human, if you take the human ha hair, um, that's about 90,000 nanometers. So when you're talking about 10 nanometers, that's the scale that we're talking about. So the most advanced chips, there's only two companies in the world that produce it today. That's uh, in South Korea. Um, that's Samsung, and in Taiwan, it's a T TCMC. And you can see the other chips, 48 and 45 nanometers. These are called legacy chips. These are also these are produced by. You can see less than 45 nanometers are produced by China too, and China's coming along strong in that space. And legacy chips are the ones that go into automotives. So those are very important too. I want you to focus on the right there, and one of the things you notice is that uh, China uh, is coming along very strong and with a, with a desire to overtake South Korea pretty soon. So 2024, 2025, China is expected to overtake South Korea and Taiwan in terms of the chip, chip industry. And that is what is concerning to the U.S. And U.S. is losing its market share too, even though we're pretty, we're pretty strong 
you, you, you heard Murray saying we have 40% of the market share, we do. We can see from the chart that we do have a strong market share in this space. And in terms of how the chip industry compares with other important industries in the US, you can see US global share of consumption is about 34%, but our manufacturing, these are all the different stages of manufacturing, uh, different stages of uh, chip design and manufacturing. Manufacturing, we have about 12%. Uh, and you can see on the right, uh, aerospace, medical equipment, pharmaceuticals, and petrochemicals, we have much larger um, manufacturing sh share in the U.S. So CHIP is the only one that's a major concern, and you can see why the, the U.S. administration and the Defense Department are, are concerned. So let me stop here, and I won't go into Intel other than when we, during question and answer session we can talk about Intel. All right? Thank you. Welcome to our final panel of our conference today. My name is James Lin. I am an assistant professor at the Jackson School of International Studies and associate chair of the Taiwan Studies program. Uh, I have the honor of introducing our three panelists for our final panel. First, we have uh, Daniel Guo Qingzhen, who is director general of the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office here in Seattle. Uh, Zhen earned his BA in diplomacy from National Zhen University, his MS in foreign service at Georgetown University. Prior to his current position as Director General, he served as Deputy Secretary General for the Taiwan Council of U.S. Affairs, second into the Foreign Minister's Office, uh, as Deputy Director in the Political Division at the Taipei Economic Cultural Representative Office, TECRO in D.C., and as Section Chief in the Department of North American Affairs in the ROC Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Our second panelist will be Ryan Huss, who is Senior Fellow at the Michael uh, I'm sorry, Senior Fellow and the Michael H. Armacost Chair in Foreign Policy Program at Brookings, where he holds a joint appointment to the John Thornton China Center and the Center for East Asia Policy Studies, and is also the Chen Fu and Cecilia Yen Ku Chair in Taiwan Studies. Uh, Haas earned his undergraduate degree here at the University of Washington, uh, followed by his graduate degree at Johns Hopkins School of International School of Advanced International Studies, SAIS. Prior to joining Brookings from 2013-2017, uh, Haas served as the director for China, Taiwan, and Mongolia at the National Security Council. And before that, he served for 15 years in the Foreign Service. He's co-authored, along with Bonnie Glazier and Richard Bush, uh, a very recently published book, Hot <laughs> Off the Press, titled U.S.-Taiwan Relations, Will China's Challenge Lead to a Crisis? Uh, and we've recently just agreed to host um, Bonnie Glazier for a book talk for this in the, the next academic year, so in the fall, hopefully. Um, finally. John Hadwami is President and General Manager of J.C. Grand, a Taiwan-based company that designs, manufactures, exports, and designs precision steel forgings to industrial customers worldwide. Uh, John earned his, his BS in Mechanical Engineering and Quantitative Economics at UC San Diego, and his PhD in Aeronautic and Mechanical Engineering at Caltech, and finally his MBA from the Foster School here at UW. So we have two alumni in this panel. Uh, before he started J.C. Grand, uh, Hadawani worked at the Boeing Tech Center in Bellevue and later at two biotechnology startups that focused on large-scale gene expression lab automation. So our theme for today, uh, this final panel, is U.S. Taiwan trade. Um, the, the short blurb that you see on the website, the U.S. and Taiwan are significant trading partners accounting for over $100 billion in trade on an annual basis. As both parties negotiate a new bilateral trade agreement, what are the stakes of this for businesses on both sides? How do ongoing geopolitical tensions affect this trade relationship? So each presenter will have eight minutes to speak, uh, and then I'll open the floor to questions from the audience. So let's give a welcome to our panelists, and I will invite Daniel to speak first since this is Daniel's first appearance. Hi everyone, I'm Daniel, Daniel, uh, Daniel Chen, the Director General of Taipei Economic Culture Office in Seattle. So it's so good to be here. You know, uh, before this uh, seminar, I envy Ryan because right now he is one of the uh, fintechs which have more freedom to speak on his will. That uh, since I'm a still kind of incurrent incumbent 
government officials. So I have some limitation. That's why, that's why I have to resort <laughs> to uh, the slide in case I made some uh, wrong mistakes. So bear with me. But sometimes the government official presentation can be very boring. I know I have eight minutes, so I will be very uh, efficient with my time. So, um, I mean, today's topic, we're going to talk about the U.S. Taiwan trade, trade and trend, chips and trend. So, I just want to give you kind of a brief introduction about how the uh, U.S. Taiwan uh, trade uh, looks like. So, um, overall, the, the picture is that uh, Taiwan export to the state has continued to grow over the, uh, the past five years. You see, for the chart, you see uh, that uh, we re in the year 2022, we have the annual increase like 40% uh, for our uh, export to, to the states. And also Taiwan imports from the states uh, in the year 2021 reach a, a, a high. So it's about five years height, an annual increase of 18%. Um, we talk about trade and we talk about investment. So this one is more amazing. So you can see the U.S. bilateral investment uh, after, uh, before and after 2016. On the right hand side, you see uh, from the year 2017 to 2021, last five years, uh, the investment for Taiwan investment in the States is grows about 431%, which is amazing. Um, I think that's because of the, uh, the US China serious competition kind of kick off. So we see kind of the, the picture changes right now. And speaking about the um, investment, so the overall take for the uh, trade relation between Taiwan and the States, you now we are the uh, second largest trading partner uh, for goods, and we, Taiwan, uh, the U.S. is also uh, Taiwan's third largest source for imports, as well as the second largest uh, destination for exports. Uh, that being wise, but if you're talking about the agricultural product, Taiwan is the second largest buyer of the uh, second largest trading buyer of the states. Um, so. We talk about the, the trade over situation, but how should we kind of proceed from here? So recently you must heard about, uh, we have EPPD, we have a TTIC, uh, those kind of initial jargons. So long story short is that to promote more trade between Taiwan and the states, then you have the uh, economic, uh, the first platform is conducted mostly from the State Department, so which is more focusing on the dialogue on policies, uh, just prevent Taiwan to be uh, from economically coerced by China and hopefully we can have more trade between both sides. But the TTIC is uh, more like a Department of Commerce and the Ministry of Economic Affairs in Taiwan, which is focusing uh, more on the uh, supply chain. Uh, we talk about the uh, EV, 5G, and uh, the source of, uh, uh, we talk about the resilience of the supply chain. Uh, TIFA was assigned actually in the year 1995, but uh, for the past 28 years, only 11 meetings was conducted. So it's always a kind of an issue between Taiwan and the state, uh, should we or should we not have the TIFA open? But uh, the TIFA is not that legally binding, so it happens when both sides have the willingness to engage, to talk about the mutual issues. But if there's no consensus, which means there will be no TIFA, uh, then may not be very beneficial for Taiwan's entrance or kind of involvement into each international region. So that's why recently we have the uh, 21st, the initiative on the 21st century trade. Um, it's kind of, this like give you a kind of brief idea about what we talk about. So you can treat this as like, um, um, I would say kind of a pretty much the ready BTA uh, agreement between Taiwan and the states. So these issues, uh, these issues, all the issues on these uh, slides also cover in the uh, USMCA or kind of CPTPP. Um, so which is good for Taiwan to be further integrated into international uh, trade orga uh, organization and also some internal regions. And also uh, on the basis, if the state and Taiwan, we feel a need to include more topics or more issues into the uh, negotiation, then under this uh, kind of platform, we can do that. So, um, I mean, all the trade agreement right now we are thinking about, uh, but there's a kind of one um, hassle right now happening between both sides. You know, I'm from yesterday discussion, we heard about the uh, supply chain, you know, uh, chips, semiconductors. But, you know, um, when we talk about the uh, possible investment from Taiwan high tech in the States, there comes to a kind of a legal hurdle. That because uh, Taiwan is the only uh, country which does not sign the, uh, trade, the, the treaty, uh, tech treaty with the States uh, among the top 10 leaders, which kind of uh, 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 kind of deduct the Taiwanese businessman willingness to invest in, in Taiwan. So for example, that the dividend tax rate, uh, if you have a treat, tax treaty 
with the states, the uh, dividend tax and also the branch profits can only be 10%. However, since Taiwan uh, does not have this kind of treaty arrangement with the states, so the uh, Taiwan businessman has to pay 30%, which kind of uh, uh, is not very good for the investment. Also, it kind of reduces uh, the kind of incentive uh, provided by the CHIPS Act, so which makes uh, Taiwanese businessmen uh, not very willing to invest in the states. Uh, just three days before that, I think the uh, House Ways and Means Committee and also the uh, Standard Finance Com Com uh, Committee, they all agree that um, they need to figure out uh, to amend the test code to reduce the burden of the U.S.-Taiwan cross-border investment, which is uh, totally a plus to uh, this kind of issue, ATTA, to be discussed in the Congress. So in the future, uh, once the taxation issues has been solved, we can see more and more uh, investment because uh, like TSMC, they don't come here just for one single company. They come here as a cluster. But for other uh, subsidiary kind of a related business, in order to uh, make them, uh, their investment here in, in the States much more smoother, then we should have this kind of agreement between both sides to, uh, to help them invest over here. Um, that being said, uh, I think yesterday, John, you mentioned about the kind of a U.S.-Taiwan uh, U.S. Taiwan relation kind of a trigger the kind of response from China. So I do give this kind of a, a thought. Um, I just want to raise to everyone here, uh, raise your attention, that uh, we have been checking, we have been seeing the uh, China's economic coercion all the time. I mean, on the top, it's just one very obvious, uh, very obvious uh, example of the Chinese uh, uh, economic coercion. So this one is uh, even kind of interesting. Um, they have kind of investigation against Taiwan. Uh, but the schedule to be end on January 12th, uh, 2024, which is one day before the Taiwan presidential elections. <laughs> so you can see, uh, I think the purpose is very self-evident. So, but actually, Taiwan is not the only victims of the China's uh, uh, econ economic coercion. You know, Lithuania is one of the most uh, obvious uh, examples. Just because they agreed to uh, open a kind of Taiwan representative office uh, uh, in, in, in Lithuania, so uh, all of a sudden, that uh, Lithuania disappeared in the China customs system. So bilateral trade between China and Lithuania was gone. Uh, even worse is there's a secondary sanction, such as some German uh, manufacturing company, they are, their parts kind of outsourcing from Lithuania. But those parts, those uh, products cannot get cleared in China's uh, customs system. So which this kind of a, uh, this kind of uh, coercion, this kind of a uh, measure taken by China, you can see everywhere, uh, like um, uh, Canada or even uh, uh, Australia. So this kind of example has been, uh, you can see everywhere. So that being said, I would uh, kind of argue about, we talk about the supply chain, we talk about the trade, uh, trade and trends. So, um, John, I'm still kind of interested in your question yesterday about the U.S. Taiwan relations, especially trade relations. Can you trigger a kind of attention or kind of uh, response from, from China? Um, to us, I, I'm, since I'm not kind of a, a, a business school student, so I'm more like an IR student, so I tend to think the things issues from more like a national security uh, perspective. So to me, I mean, uh, we thought this the, the question you think about, it's more like um, the essence of attention in Taiwan Strait on the trade side is more likely a uh, kind of competition between the uh, democratic market-oriented uh, uh, economy versus uh, authoritarian state-led uh, uh, national mercantilism. Uh, I will always make fun of this, um, uh, uh, this kind of comparison. It's like the, you have the capitalism with the U.S. Character characteristics versus the uh, socialism with uh, Chinese characteristics. So it's always kind of a competition between uh, the, their, their uh, system. So, I mean, for the past 50 years, Taiwan's economic um, uh, resilience and strength has been based on its uh, stability. So uh, we play a very, significant, a very significant role in the global supply chain. Um, so recently, the TSMC and the uh, chips is a very uh, good example. But actually, Taiwan has a lot more to offer, uh, like EV, like electronics uh, devices. So uh, I think to strengthen um, Taiwanese uh, um, the, the uh, cooperation uh, is with the states is um, very critical to the uh, uh, more secure and resilience of the global uh, trading system. So what does that matter with the states? I mean, uh, from the slides, I can show you that I mean the core interest 
for both countries to promote an inclusive and rural-based uh, international training system uh, that levels playing field for business. So that's why we need to ensure greater uh, supply chain resilience to, vent, to prevent the uh, future disruption. Um, also, uh, maintaining a leading role of the state-of-the-art innovation and manufacturing operations uh, is also to the interest of the states. Uh, to, to the states. So if Taiwan economy, uh, our economic security is compromised, uh, this will undermine the United States' leading position in critical sectors. Uh, that being said, I mean, China has uh, shown its uh, uh, evidence to set up its kind of a rules of order, try to, uh, from the Ukraine invasion in uh, being invaded, the case we find out they try to have their own system. They want all the trade to be conducted and denominated in renminbi, not US dollars. So you can see all kind of a debt uh, trap uh, happen in the uh, countries along the BRI, the Bear and Road Initiative. So, um, so um, I, I would say, just like to, uh, uh, to echo uh, John's uh, and Ryan's uh, remarks yesterday, I mean, Taiwan is not uh, part of a US-China relation, but actually it's a global security issues. I mean, that's why, I, as a major takeaway, I, I hope I can provide you uh, for today's uh, uh, presentation. Thank you. Well, good morning. I have the uh, the honor of being sandwiched in between the two important speakers in this panel, so I'm going to uh, try to be brief. But before I uh, uh, launch into my comments, I've, I just want to take a moment to pause and congratulate Professor Lin and the entire team here. Uh, this Taiwan Studies program at the University of Washington has really become uh, one of the uh, most significant centers for study of Taiwan issues in the United States alongside Harvard and Stanford, which is pretty good company uh, for, for the university to keep. And, uh, and, and it's a tribute to the, the great work that they've done. I, I was trying to think this morning about what I could offer that would be complementary to the on the ground, uh, in the trenches perspective that John will provide and the government uh, perspective and strategic view that, uh, that the Director General provided. I think what I can contribute is a perspective from Washington, D.C. about how this all sort of fits together, trade, U.S.-Taiwan trade fits together in a, in a strategic context. And the key takeaway that I hope I leave you with, if, if nothing else, is that trade issues are the most critical area for the United States and Taiwan to make progress in the next 12 months. This is the game. This is it. Um, and, and part of the reason I say that, uh, having previously served in government, is that oftentimes strategy is driven by calendars. And the calendar of the next year is that the United States will be hosting the APEC leaders meeting in November. Taiwan will be having an election, a presidential and legislative election in January. And they will be having an inauguration in May. President Tsai is a former trade negotiator um, by profession. Trade is her top priority. Trade is also critical to sort of beating back against the, the goal that, that China is trying to establish of inducing a sense of fatalism inside Taiwan about its future. I think that Beijing would like to seed a narrative that China is unstoppable, that the United States is unreliable, and that the cross-strait status quo is unsustainable. That's the challenge that we're up against. And uh, making significant, tangible, enduring progress on strengthening U.S.-Taiwan trade ties is the most potent tool available to the United States to push back against the fatalism that, that Beijing is trying to sell. The reason why I think Beijing is trying to sell this narrative is because they want to isolate Taiwan and increase, ta increase Taiwan's dependency upon the mainland for Taiwan's future security and prosperity. This is their theory of the case for building gravitational pull to draw Taiwan uh, into their orbit. And we should be honest with ourselves that, that China has had some success in limiting Taiwan's other options for deepening trade ties around the world. Taiwan only has two substantial free trade agreements in the world with uh, New Zealand and Singapore, which were basically achieved after China gave a wink and a nod to New Zealand and Singapore to, to pursue those trade agreements. Notably, both of those countries already had previously established free trade agreements with China before they were uh, pursuing them with, with Taiwan. 
China has succeeded in excluding Taiwan from the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, a, uh, a trade uh, block in Asia that includes ASEAN countries as well as many countries in Northeast Asia. China has signaled its opposition to Taiwan's entry into the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, CPTPP. And so what's happening is, is Taiwan is being left out and squeezed out of these blocks that are creating these, uh, these zones of convergence in Asia. And each time this happens, uh, Taiwan's competitive position becomes further challenged. Taiwan's domestic market is not big enough on its own to support the R&D and scaling up of new and emerging technologies that, uh, that Taiwan needs to remain at the cutting edge. So I guess the point that I'm trying to drive towards is that unless Taiwan finds new pathways for expanding trade and investment facilitation, its vulnerability to Chinese coercion is, is going to grow. And if the United States does not lead the way in pushing forward uh, ambitious trade efforts with Taiwan, it's going to be more difficult for other countries who feel more vulnerable uh, to, to China to follow. Typically, in my experience on, on the trade front, countries feel most comfortable drafting off of and following behind uh, the United States in these efforts, rather than being the wind shear themselves that is out in front taking hits from Beijing. And so this is the time uh, for, for us to make progress. And we should also keep in mind that we're not doing this as charity. We're doing this because it's in America's interest to advance trade ties with Taiwan. Um, Taiwan is, is essential to America's technological competitiveness. Taiwan is essential to supply chain resiliency. American supply chain resiliency is not available as an option unless the United States and Taiwan are moving in a, a common direction. So we have 12 months. The clock is ticking um, before President Tsai uh, leaves office. I don't think that we should leave uh, a lot of this work as a to-do item in the inbox of the next president of Taiwan. Uh, we should seize the moment that we have now. And in order for us to do this, I just have a couple of, of practical suggestions. Um, the first is to have the Biden administration agree that trade is the, uh, the central area where the relationship can achieve progress over the next 12 months that in the prioritization of issues, trade uh, comes out on top. And we shouldn't be bashful or timid about this. If you think about the last two major surges in cross-strait tensions, they weren't because of trade issues. They were because of symbolic actions that, that Beijing felt challenged and humiliated their conception of, of unofficial relations. And typically, U.S.-Taiwan trade issues are not a source of major stress in either the U.S.-China context or the cross-strait context. So this is an, an area where we should be uh, leaning forward. But to do so, I think that the White House is going to need to play traffic cop a little bit. Uh, the Director General's slide a moment ago listed four uh, parallel trade talks that are going on. Uh, that's a, a messy or, uh, org chart to be following. There's the, the TIFA talks, which the United States Trade Representative leads, which uh, focus on traditional trade issues. There's the U.S.-Taiwan Economic Pro Prosperity Partnership Dialogue, which the State Department leads. There's the Technology Trade and Investment Collaboration Framework, which the Commerce Department leads. And then there's also the 21st Century Trade Initiative. So in order for all these things to achieve uh, you know, their potential, there's going to need to be a certain harmonization of these respective efforts. Uh, and, and not uh, sort of a competitive dynamic where each side is infringing upon uh, the other's prerogatives. So I guess if, if, I, if I've left you with anything, I hope it's a note of optimism that, uh, that, that this is the critical issue and that there is space uh, for, for meaningful progress. Um, and I hope that we see an early harvest on the 21st Century Trade Initiative before the APEC leaders meeting in November this fall. The reason why that date is important is that's the target date at which the United States is hoping to achieve progress on its Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, to have an early harvest there. The Indo-Pacific Economic Framework uh, notably excludes Taiwan. Taiwan's um, consolation prize was the 21st Century Trade Initiative. And if one advances while the other languishes, uh, then we will have uh, failed in our efforts to try to advance the, the U.S.-Taiwan trade agenda. So. 
I will leave it there. I really look forward to the discussion and listening to what John has to say next. I must say the uh, w one thing I learned from this uh, this panel is that the the only only one better at coming up with acronyms than the uh, the business school people are the uh, trade representatives. <laughs> <laughs> they seem to come up with an acronym. I I, I get confused myself. Um, so again, I mean, those who just to give myself a context, I I am definitely not a policy person, and so that's I mean, it's great to have uh, Director Chen and, and Ryan here to to give some perspective. Another thing I like about this session is and it it shows how interactive it is. Is that I find myself taking in what I heard yesterday, especially for Ryan's talk, and sort of changing the way—I mean, changing the way I will speak now because he's—he's he's put a couple of ideas in my head that I didn't have before this session started. That it's actually quite positive, but it's—it's uh, it's really interesting. So I find myself learning in real time. So again, my background is—I mean, the context in which I'm giving my comments is as a. Private, you know, private enterprise, private enterprise uh, company that's that's manufacturing both in Taiwan, it's based in Taiwan, but also in, in China. So I see sort of many fronts to this uh, this dynamic, um, and we do a substantial trade with the U.S. So I have some personal interest in, in having uh, good trade relations between Taiwan and, and uh, the United States. Um, I think generally I was going to come up with, you know, it, I, I would love for a trade agreement, a bilateral trade agreement, or any kind of trade agreement involving Taiwan to be purely about economics. I mean, in an ideal world, and from my background, that would be lovely. It's not the reality, as we've talked about. Everything has a geopolitical and a, a dynamic to it and, and an angle. And I think to, to ignore the elephant in the room, I think, is, is, would be not wise. Um, and I'm just going to be building on what's already been stated here, both in the semiconductor panel and in the, in the the remarks we've already heard in this panel, um, it's really all about security. With, with uh, at least, at least you have to you have to acknowledge that dynamic that this is all about security vis-a-vis -vis China and Taiwan. You know, if if not, nothing else, they want to avoid isolation. And, and Ryan just made the remark, and it was amazing that we were on the same dynamic. It's it seems to be China's strategy with regard to Taiwan is to just one by one. Isolate them in various ways, whether it's you know uh, having individual countries change their re re uh, diplomatic recognition from Taipei to uh, Beijing, or pulling them off of the you know the World Health Organization or any multilateral organization for anything, whether it's economic or health or anything. So, and I think the idea, the theory. I don't know if I buy into the theory, but the theory is is that if you if you eventually leave them with nothing. Then they're just going to say, "Okay, well, sorry. Okay, now we have nothing. We're going to go. You know, we'll we'll find. We'll we'll work it out where we're going to be subsumed into China." I guess as the theory goes. I, I don't buy it, but it's that's where this headed. I do notice this. I live in a district in Taipei, um, in Tianmu, where we have where, where is sort of the de facto embassies for a lot a lot of the the countries that still recognize Taiwan, and they have these flagpoles for each of the countries. They go and once in a while you go see the flag come down and they, they're, they're losing one flag. And it's sort of like a visual for what's going on in the real world. I, I find that a little bit. But I, I, I'm optimistic because I don't think that's what it's all about. What it's, you know, this trade agreement that they're talking, the bilateral trade agreement, this is another thing that Ryan put in it when I was thinking about and this gives me some hope. Um, I think when we were talking about the Trans-Pacific Partnership before and the CTPP, I, I get the acronyms all wrong. Um, and I asked the question yesterday, is this going to cause a problem for Taiwan just, just politically or you know, to try to join these multilateral? I know it's always frowned upon. I mean, China seems to have a veto power over Taiwan joining these uh, multilateral organizations. But uh, I think I, I like the idea that if, you know, US really needs to take the lead in showing an alternative to, uh, to something like the TPP. If, if Taiwan's not going to join the TPP, if the, if the U.S. takes the lead and has a bilateral or, or substantial progress, if not an outright bilateral trade agreement, then maybe that's the the crack 
that, that you know, the proverbial crack that breaks open the dam, and then every, every one of the G7, if not G20 ex China, now does something similar. If not a trade agreement, then it's much more acceptable to, to form trade relations, formal trade relations with Taiwan. That's, that's my hope. And maybe it does. I mean, if the, you know, the, uh, I think from an economic perspective, besides you know, the security that that would, you know, security implications that, that a bilateral trade agreement would confer on the Taiwan, that's already pretty substantial. But just economically, I think, you know, I'm always worried for, as a business owner that just even in, in tariff access to, to the U.S. market, even a few percent can make a difference between, you know, whether Korea, you know, some of our economic competitors, I mean, friendly economic competitors in Southeast Asia, Japan, Korea, have equal access to the U.S. market. So as a business owner, that's really important to me because, you know, I, I don't want to have to relocate my operations for one or two percent or five percent of some kind of tariff. And so I, I want to see an equal footing for, for everyone, including Taiwan, in the U.S. market. That would be an ideal outcome. Um, I think we also want to see a facilitation of foreign direct investment in Taiwan. That, you know, that is, is that's important always. Uh, so we've been talking a lot about Taiwan investing in the U.S. I like to see there's a lot of businesses outside of semiconductors, whether it's biotechnology, uh, electric vehicles, all, all sorts of both technological and just, just uh, financial services that are, are, could be, you know, could invest in Taiwan. I think what wasn't covered this, in this semiconductor panel that I think is very important is also something that the U.S. can offer to Taiwan when we're talking about, you know, relocating semiconductor fabs in the U.S. Energy is, the, is, is a huge thing coming up. And, and it's something that, that occupies, even in my industry, but in the semiconductor industry, it's everything. It's just a huge consumer of, of energy and of water. I'm not less worried about water. Taiwan just needs some infrastructure investment. They have plenty of water, just need to get it to where it needs to go. But, but in energy is really important. So that's something that if a bilateral trade agreement could cover energy in and of itself would be a, a game changer. Um, they've talk, they, we've talked about the, uh, some, of, some of the, let's say, breakthroughs uh, or maybe uh, advances in, in a potential bilateral trade agreement that the 21st century trade, and it covers these five areas. It's already been mentioned here. I think the idea is, and this, this I see, I, I, um, I am part of a few different organiza uh, business organizations. One of them is AmCham, uh, American Chamber of Commerce in Taiwan. Also the ANZ CHAM, which is the Australian New Zealand Chamber of Commerce, and the CCCT, which is the European Chamber of Commerce. I'm involved, you know, my social and business circle involves all of those. And we see this a lot. So the, the, the initial bilateral trade agreement, uh, the five areas in which they agreed to work together to try to move towards a bilateral trade agreement and eventually maybe a free trade agreement, I think really involves trying to get harmonize some of the Taiwan standards with sort of more international or U.S. standards. I think bluntly, the Ta really Taiwan is going to have to. There, there's a. I see this a lot. I mean, if any anyone who's tried for a foreigner trying to open a bank account in Taiwan knows that that's just the tip of the iceberg of the regulatory framework that probably needs to be adjusted in Taiwan. Um, you know, I, I don't. The, the good news is, and I was talking with with James earlier. I, I don't think this is a. In some countries, you might perceive that to be a, tr a an unofficial trade barrier. I don't think in Taiwan's case it is. I think this is just moving the the service regulation and the service infrastructure to something a little bit more modern. Whether it's digitization, that's been a big thing. If maybe if in your own time, if you want to learn. Uh, about sort of the issues affecting the bilateral trade agreement. The, the, Taiwan, uh, the American Chamber of Commerce produces a white paper every year, and they cover, I think, 26 sectors, uh, you know, finance and automobile and pharmaceuticals. They, ha they cover a bunch of different industries. And that talks about areas in which Taiwan, they, they, I think that probably <laughs> the director Chen probably, did, it's probably annoying to some of the, the Taiwan's government officials because the U.S. just bangs on about all these things that they want Taiwan to do. But in fairness, the American Chamber of Commerce goes back to Washington and bugs the, the, uh, the Congress about, um, imp you know, they, they definitely are the biggest advocates for a free trade agreement. They want Taiwan to have a seat at the table. So their, their intentions are right. I know that they can be a bit pesky 
uh, with these with, with, and pushy about these things. But really, I think these these uh, you know regulations that need to be harmonized, um, yeah, and I think are it's a small small hurdle. I think Taiwan is up to the task, and I think I think we'll get there. In the past, I only mentioned one thing about agriculture. Every free trade negotiator knows that as soon as you come to this, this great agreement, for whatever reason, the agricultural lobby always gets in the way. And um, Taiwan has its own, you know, in, in the U.S. too, frankly, has their own agricultural lobby. It's not the biggest thing. You know, semiconductors are a way bigger part. The agriculture is a smaller part of this whole thing. But if you want to get people excited about things, you talk about erect hope in, in, in pork in Taiwan, I mean, you can get people getting all sort of, you know, they get exercised about that. And, you know, tar or the U.S. putting, you know, hormones in beef, you know, they get pretty, pretty excited about that too. And so I don't think this is going to be an issue this time, though, because I think there's so much momentum around the security arrangement. I think a lot of that, in, in, and uh, President Tsai has done a very good job about tamping down some of the excitement over the agricultural lobby uh, and just trying to focus, focus minds on... Uh, on, on the task at hand, which is really improving trade relations with the United States. And, and that's, and I think, I don't think agriculture is going to get in the way this time. So that's, that's my final thought.